Good evening, everyone. Good evening. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So tonight, I don't have any notes because I know the icons pretty well. This is the one thing that I didn't have to... Um, it's something that I've known for a while here. So um, I'd like to share a few things with you all. And I'd like to preface this by saying that one of our seminary professors is a monk from Mount Athos. So he went and he studied, he got his degree at Holy Cross, left, went to Mount Athos for 15, 20 years, whatever it was, um, and then came back to the States and is one of like the leading theologians, theological minds, really an impressive individual. He's also very talented at chanting. He's a talented writer, talented translator, and also like privately known, he's a very talented iconographer. So at times in his classes, he really brings to life things, but he also has a book that is called The Art of Seeing. The Art of Seeing by Father Maximus Constus. If you have seen anything written before that, he was not ordained, so his name would have been Nicholas Constus. And I see Michael over there having a good time because Michael just came back from Crossroad, which is the, the program with its um, primary location being at Helena College Holy Cross. And Michael was um, in his midst and he was, you know, doing lectures and stuff um, under the guidance of Father Maximus. I know Andre has been um, also in the same spirit in the time that he was at Helena College too. So with that being said, some of what I'm going to say is from that book that he wrote and is kind of revelatory to me. So I'll share a few things and I'll let you know when it's something that I found from that book so that if you're interested, the book is not that um, long in length, but it's very deep in its um, message overall. So we have the blessing in the Orthodox Church of having iconography. That's something apparent to us all. But from the very earliest times in the church's life, iconography had almost a different dimension of importance. Because as we know, we all have colleges, we have schools, we have textbooks, we have people who tell us and they guide us. But in the early times of the church, many people were not literate. They didn't have books. They didn't have an abundance of schools, forms of education and things like that. So for those people, the only time that they would know the gospel is when it was read aloud to them, whether it be on a Sunday during liturgy, during any of the other services, or when it was vividly portrayed before their eyes. So iconography has a very special placement in the course in life of the church because it tells us a further dimension as to what's happening. The iconography is not meant to be one image, one person, and that's it. It's to lend us to a further reality. So what we're going to talk about tonight is some kind of the nuances that we may not um, know to look at immediately or that we don't know unless we know more of the different um, pieces in the icons. So I would say that next to Christ, the Virgin Mary is in the most iconography that we know of. But having said that, she may be in more because she's in half of the ones with our Lord. So it's amazing the way that we see importance once again in her placement in the Orthodox Church. So I want to call forth a few things um, along the way. We're going to talk about some of the icons that are here in the sanctuary, um, and then I'm going to share a few more things. So we talked about the... Um, I'm going to go through kind of the course of her life in order to be able to um, remember the, the life of the mother of God and then the icons. And it's amazing because at times I'll stop and I'll say how these are pertinent in the services that we talked about or in the life of the other services that we have. So we see the very first icon that I'd like to show you is this one right over here. It's in the apps on that side. And it's a little bit obstructed by the um, icon screen here, but nonetheless, we have the elder right here, the elder Zachariah, and we just heard in the um, in the the teaching in the gospel where it says, "And Mary entered the home of Elizabeth and Zachariah." Zachariah being the head priest, the high priest. It's also what we named our son, 
And we know that she is being presented into the temple. We know from the tradition that Saints Joachim and Anna were elder in their years. They were barren. They were not able to, to conceive and to upbring a child. And so they called out from the beauty of their hearts, again, being aged in their years, saying, Lord, if you grant us a child, we will then offer this child completely back to you. Which I think is amazing because if any of us are parents, you know how hard that must have been. You know the love and connectivity to then just offer your child into the temple. Yes, it was different in a way because some of the, the kids or some of the youth were reared in the temple, but nonetheless, the parents still had to physically walk, as we see, into the temple and bring their child forth. So uniquely, we see that the, if you can see it, probably not, the Virgin Mary is being brought by her parents right there into the temple to be received by the elder, by the high priest, Zechariah. And then later you see that she is on the throne right there. We talked last time about how the Virgin Mary transformed the Old Testament where the people received manna as the life-giving bread. And now she is coming forth to receive the life-giving bread into her womb. So this is that kind of depiction with the angel going forth. So it's amazing because then we go and we know of the Annunciation. And the Annunciation, there's a larger image right here. So if you're able to see that, um, and if not, I'm going to describe what most of us know in the icon and then something particular. So again, we see that the archangel is running to her with a stance of, of almost eagerness or a, a sense of authority bringing a message. And we know that the archangel Michael is the one who is the messenger of the good news. So he is coming forth, running towards her, soaring towards her, whatever it may be. And you see that the Virgin Mary is there and she has like a, um, a loom or a a wheel that you can sew with, okay? And so in another more close depiction maybe, she may also have like a spool of thread in her hand. There's two symbolisms that I've heard, and I know that both have a certain merit to them, um, not one being more correct than the other. One being that when the Annunciation took place, she started to weave salvation in her womb, so she, she was meticulously, and like a mother can only do, was weaving a child in her womb, was weaving, taking that message and experiencing motherhood from it. The other um, teaching that we have in the church is that she, at the time, those who were in the temple would often knit different things that were like liturgical not vestments, but like clo cloths, for example, like the altar cloth or like these kind of things that are adorned um, cl cloths or, you know, there's, there's a name for it, but it's, so the, the, the kalimata, the things that cover the different holy spaces. And so one of the traditions tells us that she was weaving the curtain of the temple, right? The curtain of the temple being what in essence, separated the, the proper space of worship to the Holy of Holies. And again, at this time, the Holy of Holies was something delineated more than it is now, for example, right? So only the high priest was allowed in the Holy of Holies, then being transformed by the person of Christ, coming forth, and now Christ himself is the offering that is distributed to all. But the teaching goes forth to say that not only did she weave and, and knit those, um, those curtains of the temple, but that this curtain was also the one that tore in two when Christ was crucified, right? We hear that when Christ died on the cross and it was dark and the curtain of the temple tore in two, that's another teaching that we have that says why or that that was the... the um, that was what she was weaving at the time. So again, just very interesting things about how when we kind of lend further our attention to the icons that we learn a little bit more.
okay? And I, uh, one of the next things in sequence we have is the nativity of Christ. So she bore Christ in her womb, and then she gave birth to him. And it shows here, as you can tell, the most central figure, or the central figures, plural, are Jesus Christ himself as the newborn and his mother. And it's an interesting thing that we see here because just like in the other icons of the mother of God, she's wearing blue in this icon, right? We know that I'm wearing blue. The vestments have been blue because of her um, time. And that's the color that one of the colors that represents her. But in iconography, blue as a base layer refers to humanity. So the Virgin Mary is human. She was born like any of us. She was not God. She was without sin. And you see that there's like a red, um, I don't know, cloth or it's, it's, it's a visual expression in this sense that there's a red behind her. So when she bore God, and you can see this in all of the other icons of her, she took on God. She took on divinity. So she has that base layer of humanity taking on the divinity of Christ, taking on the divinity of God becoming man. Okay? So then moving forward, we also have in all of the icons of her, this color scheme, if you will, where she has the blue as her base layer. She is human like all of us. And then she took on the divinity And you see, in contrast, that Christ is the only one with the other color scheme, where he is fully God and then takes on humanity. He's fully God and then became human for our salvation. So it's another beautiful way that we can continue to remember the mother of God. So then after some time, they brought forth Christ into the temple. And this is the, this is this, um, apps piece right over here. And there's also a motion in this as well. And so you have Joseph, St. Joseph right there, the betrothed, and then you have the Virgin Mary bringing forth her child, Jesus Christ, into the temple, just as she was brought into the temple, and the elder Simeon. And what we know of the elder Simeon is that he was great in years, whether the numerical value is proper or not, it, he was known to be 300 years or so. The point being that he was well advanced in years past earthly life in a way. And he kept saying to God, calling out, saying, Lord, I will know that it is time for me to depart this life once I receive the Lord into my midst. And so you see him right here. And so Christ is brought into the temple. He is given to the elder Simeon. And the elder Simeon, once he receives Christ, he then gives the child back to the Virgin Mary and says, O Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and glory of your people Israel. So I was just telling some people that the other day that when we do the 40-day blessing, The mother and her child are brought forth into the temple, into the sanctuary. They bring the child up to the holy altar space. And then right before, and as the priest is giving the child back, we say, I'm giving the child back to the mother. O Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. So again, the theology of the church, the hymns of the church, the iconography of the church, and the prayers and services of the church, all, they just continue to intersect. It's like a rope that is woven, and you just keep going and going and going. And so this is one of the things I learned from this book by Father Maximus, is that anytime you have an icon, which is a very common depiction of the mother of God with Christ as a child, we can think of this similar to us being the elder Simeon, us being that person who is awaiting Christ to be in our midst, who is waiting to receive God in our lives. And Jesus Christ himself, like in the temple, is being given to us by his mother. So this is like a zoomed in, 
zoomed in icon of that icon before that icon. It's an interesting concept, but after I heard that, it's, it's like Christ is being given to us by the Virgin Mary. And I've always found that to be interesting because I think so often I focus more, and, and I think the world focuses more, on Jesus Christ being given to us, Jesus Christ being in our midst. But how often do we think about the importance of the mother of God in the placement of Jesus Christ being given to us? So this is one of the things that um, I found to be specifically very interesting from that book. Okay, and so for the, there's two more that I want to bring forth here. Um, One is that we have the icon where the mother of God is enthroned to the heavens. Okay, and so we have this depiction, and again, with her motherly and her earthly human blue as her base layer and divinity as her external and and what she takes on. And this is the throne of God where the, the Christ child is enthroned into the seat of heaven. And it says, the platitera ton uranon. The, the higher than the heavens, the one who is more spacious than all of the heavens. And so we talked about this the other day, that just as the, the heavens are vast and wide, like the celestial beings, like all of the, the sky, the stars in the sky, it's an unfathomable great space. And she is the only one who can accompany that space and receive God, just as her womb was the only space that could contain God in the earthly sense. She was a virgin's womb in humanity and took on into her womb the divinity. So that's something that I wanted to to share and bring forth. The other thing that, that I found to be very interesting and I think is important about her life and why we exalt her and recognize her above other saints is because Jesus Christ was God and man and did not sin. Okay, so for God not to sin is, is a more understandable thing. But for a person to be born and not sin, for the Virgin Mary to not sin, is another dimension that we can potentially be more inclined to know about be something that we can draw closer to. Because each of us has our particular moments, our particular struggles and things that we encounter in life. But when we see the purity of the mother of God before us, in all of the icon depictions of her, we're once again centered into a sacred space. We're centered into a life focusing on Christ himself. And it's interesting because I always think about if the Virgin Mary and Christ were sitting next together and you approached both of them, Christ would probably say, please go and give my mother a hug first. And he would, she would probably say, please go and kiss my son's hand first. So I, I always think about this. That's, there's no theological element there. That's just something that I've felt inside and, 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 and think about. And so anyways, I, I share these things. Um, and then also... I wanted to bring forth, I forgot to say this about the hymnology last time. So we have the Dominical Feast of our Lord. There are 12 feasts of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 12 great feasts. And one of them that we just celebrated being Transfiguration, this is not depicted in the icon, but is written in the hymn that is prescribed for this um, feast. And it says, You were transfigured upon the mountain, O Christ our God. And then the very last clause or sentence says, through the intercessions of the Theotokos, save us. And that's something that strikes me by saying that even one of the greatest feasts of the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that quite literally does not have to do too much with his mother at all, still recognizes her in the beauty of that hymn. So kind of like this thought in this message that Christ would always show us his mother and she would always show us him. It's, it's a very beautiful thing that when we focus more 
And that's part of the reason why we use the worship guide on Sundays. It's not so that we can all sing the hymn and exalt all together. It's also so that we can read the words that are brought forth. And it was only during that time last Sunday that I recognized that for the first time. The recognize that the Virgin Mary is also lauded in this hymn. So two more that I would like to show you here. Um, one is, we talked about it the other day, where the Virgin Mary is the one who, in a way, gave Christ the inspiration to go and to work up, perform his first public miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. And so, you see that the steward of the feast is there, and this is a biblical narrative. So, another beautiful thing about iconography is that this is literally a depiction of all of those words in that text of the gospel, in the gospel of Luke, of the wedding at Cana of Galilee. So we know that his mother holds great importance to her, to him, and she is the one, in a way, directing him to do this. So she is probably one of the only ones that was able to tell Christ, go and do this and work this miracle. So I find that to be of great importance as well. Okay, and so for the last icon that I want to discuss for this evening— is the icon of the Dormition of the Falling Asleep of the Virgin Mary, which is in the back corner over there. And this is the feast that we are approaching. The reason why we were doing all these services and these classes with attention is leading up to her Dormition. I'll speak a few things theologically about this, but they're also present there in the icon. So you see that all of the apostles are gathered there. And you know that Jesus Christ himself was not physically there present, right? He was not living at that time. But you see Christ present in the form of him coming and bringing his mother back. And you see that, once again, he may not have physically been a parent, but he mystically was there. And you see that he's holding in his arms a small child. He is holding in his arms the soul of his beautiful mother, to bring her up into the heavens because we know that the soul is brought forth before the body is then um, brought to the heavens as well. But also in our theology, we believe that she also was lifted in body as well. So you see that these things are truly a beautiful thing because the more that we give our attention and we learn about these things, the more our faith deepens. So when these feasts happen, when we sing the hymn of transfiguration, all of a sudden we have a more encompassing experience. So at this time, I thank you all for being here. Thank you for a wonderful evening. And Mayor Panaya, the Theotokos, continue to be with us and to intercede for us and forevermore. And also, I just, I see many mothers in here, and I wish... I, there's, I don't know what to say, but there's something of uh, the Virgin Mary and motherhood that continues to coincide. So remember her as mothers, and hopefully we as men can remember her um, with the same presence that you all have in your hearts. May our dear Lord continue to bless you on this day and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.